So this is the chapter seven overview. I will uh, flip through the uh, six sections and uh, talk about some of the things, uh, highlight some of the things that you will see covered in lecture and especially where you will see them covered in lecture slightly differently in terms of style and uh, well, introduction of concepts. And the biggest place where you will see the difference between how the lecture covers it and how your textbook does it is basically the placement of section 7.1. In your textbook, that's your very first section, 7.1 wave functions and um, and you know it's a valid approach <laughs> wave mechanics is about wave functions and you know these are important questions to answer what does it mean for a particle to act like a wave what precisely is waving those are very important questions to answer and um, and I feel that those are also very difficult questions to answer. So that's why in the lecture, uh, what's covered the uh, materials that correspond to section 7.1, we will be covering it almost towards the end of the week. That's when you will see them covered in the lecture. Lecture kind of starts with uh, somewhere around the section 7.3 and 7.4, um, because wave mechanics can be very, highly um, abstract conceptually and uh, mathematically rigorous. And those are both the combinations that um, <laughs> result in topics that are difficult to understand. And whenever I've had a difficult topics in abstract math or physics, what I myself benefited uh, what, from was seeing lots of examples and actually lots of counter examples. So, um, so that's why when you follow the lecture, you will see me covering materials that relate to these first and then really go to section 7.1 last. Um, having said all that, if you are reading through the textbook as you should be, then this is a you know, perfectly fine representation. Just um, be mindful that there's a bit of, uh, quite a bit of mathematics that's all thrown at you all at once <laughs> in section 7.1. One thing that is nice is this uh, is a really good starting point. This question of the double solid interference from way back in physical optics, that's a great place to start because um, there's a great deal of explanation of this that will help you, one, remember <laughs> the interference phenomena that led people to conclude that light is a wave that still applies today. And two, uh, in this uh, description of the particle description of light, um, what it means for light to be a particle and what it doesn't mean. Um, so, so that's the place to start. And uh, I said uh, earlier up above that, the question of what is waving is a very difficult to question to answer. And it's because you can't really assign a meaning to the wave function to its, uh, itself. It, to assign a physical meaning to the function itself is difficult um, outside of this uh, particular example of light where you could say, oh, the wave function is the, the function of the electric field. and that kind of makes sense for light, but for almost anything else, it's not quite clear. But where you can assign a meaning to is the absolute squared of the wave function. And, um, and your textbook kind of takes a little bit of time before mentioning it. This wave function in general, it's a complex function. So this absolute squared does mean something very specific. You know, the, the complex conjugate times the function itself. <laughs> a benefit for us is that I've introduced the complex exponentials way back when, because I knew this was on, on the way. So, but um, this uh, assign, ass assigning the meaning to the absolute value squared of the wave function uh, as being the probability density, uh, that's the starting place. That's really the grounding place for uh, giving, starting to give concrete meaning to these quantum mechanical things, which are difficult in a bunch of different ways. So your textbook goes through that and uh, it's uh, kind of good to see the difference between how the distinction between the wave function itself and wave function 
absolute value squared. Because um, so there are cases where they look practically the same. There are cases where they start to look a little different, and um, and this is also different. And there will be all, all other cases that involve interference where if you are adding wave functions together and then taking the absolute squared versus if you are somehow doing absolute squared first and then adding them, you do get totally different result. So that distinction is important to understand and remember. And this is kind of what I was getting at. Normalization condition, I'll get to like at the end of the week uh, in the lecture, normalization of wave function is kind of very last bit of lectures you will see this week. Um, and in fact, I think a section 7.1 covers is something that we won't cover until next week, which is um, Copenhagen interpretation. Maybe I mentioned it a little bit. This will get later. Um, I think, oh, I remember what it was, expectation value. So calculation of expectation value and things like that, uh, we'll do that next week. And you will see in the homework associated the next two week, uh, things relating to this. But uh, this is actually one of the ways you can generate um, concrete examples with uh, quantum mechanics. In a way, you know, it's not, you know, it's not conceptually confusing like a Schrodinger's cat. It's, uh, I think I, kind of responded to a discussion post. People tend to misunderstand the whole point of Schrodinger's cat and let's not get into that. Calculation of expectation value is where you can just do the math and there are very concrete meanings you can assign to that mathematical result you get. So, um, but this is coming next week. So um, I will probably include section 7.1 in the list of sections for next week as well because this is the section that's kind of split between this week and the next week. Um, so that's section 7.1. I do say for this week, you know, skim through it and whatever confuses you, uh, you know, watch the lecture <laughs> and, and then um, uh, just to prep, plan to come back to it next week. Oh, uh, I do. Uh, I think this week I kind of start by introducing the operator. I don't know why they introduce operator here. Uh, there's a more intuitive way to introduce it. So, uh, which I try to do in the lecture. Uh, so, um, yeah. I mean, do, do read it through it. But if any of this seems confusing, then skim it, skip it, and look at the lecture. See if lecture makes more sense. Um, now, section seven point two through. Um, I guess the rest are a bit more concrete. There are more concrete examples you can rely on. The uncertainty principle is one where, um, at least until you run against something called interpretation of quantum mechanics, there's actual, you know, there, there's nothing that could be clearer about quantum mechanics. Uncertainty principle is one of them. And in fact, if you have this view of quantum mechanical particle as a wave packet, then you can clearly see a connection between the, the uncertainty in the wavelengths of a, uh, plane waves that needed to be added together in order to form a localized uh, wave packet that kind of corresponds to localized particle. Uh, there's a connection between these uh, different wavelengths and the uncertainty in momentum. You can almost get at it even now. Last two or yeah, last week we covered the De Broglie De relationship, which connects momentum with the wavelength. So you can at least conceptually see the connection between uncertainty in the wavelength and resulting uncertainty in momentum. And so, so. In terms of um, the origin of uncertainty principle, you can kind of look at it from a purely theoretical way. And uh, and that's, I think, perfectly fine. And I'll I might be able to highlight some of this using a FET simulation, which I think is useful. And uh, we won't spend a lot of time on energy and time uncertainty principle. I would say, you know, look at the formula. I don't think your textbook really drives it, which makes sense. Um, the derivation of this relationship, it can be a little bit tricky because um, there's a, when you get into the me uh, mechanics of quantum mechanics, there's a clear distinction between the quantities that are here and the uh, quantities that are here. So as you will see in the 
uh, lecture, uh, position and momentum are operators. There are uh, there are a mathematical thing in a linear algebra thing. <laughs> they have a particular property, one of which is they don't commute, and <laughs> their non-commutability is what results in this uncertainty principle. Which you know it's kind of upper division content, so we don't quite get into that. Um, but the important thing here is that position and momentum are operators. There's an operator representation of them. So they are not just the variables. The quantities you see here, um, energy and time. Energy can be an operator. There is an energy operator that you will see in lecture. Time is not an operator. That's just a parameter. So there's in the kind of fundamental sense, there's a big gap between this uncertainty principle and the position momentum uncertainty principle. And uh, at this lower division, I think it's good to just gloss over it and not get too deep into it. Um, so I'll just say, you do have some homework questions that rely on you to know this um, expression of energy time uncertainty principle and know how to look it up and answer questions based on that. And we won't get into too big much of a minutiae regarding this at least not until we do particle physics later on. Um, so that's uncertainty principle. Uh, section 7.3 is the, um, that's the big one. This is the, um, the uh, how do you call it? Um, I, I call this uh, Schrodinger equation, the Newton's second law of quantum mechanics. This is the starting place for everything quantum mechanical. And uh, I think your, the way your textbook motivates Schrodinger equation is quite similar to how you will see it done in the lecture, uh, except, you know, this is <laughs> something that only applies to massless particle. Um, <laughs> so, and <laughs> when we write this, it's quite explicitly a non-relativistic expression. So there are things you have to be careful about. And I guess, uh, so, okay, so here they didn't quite finish it drawing the um, connection. Um, so in the lecture, you will see the motivation for this particular form of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Um, this, uh, so you can kind of draw a connect one-to-one -one connection between this term here and this term here, this term here and this term here, and this energy term and this energy operator. So, so, um, so, but I, I think that introduction is, um, that motivation and introduction is mean, useful, if for nothing else, so that you can remember this equation more easily. Um, you know, unlike F equals MA, this is quite complicated looking equation. And the best way I found to memorize it is by understanding where each of these complicated looking partial differential equation comes from. Uh, once you understand that, then I think you'll find that it's actually quite easy to remember. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, this is, uh, where they're talking about. So this only applies to what's called a stationary state or um, energy eigenstate, because in order to write this, this E has to be a definite value. And we'll cover that in the lecture, but this is one of the forms of wave function that you'll see. And um, by dealing, choosing to only deal with the energy eigenstate, you can get something called a time independent Schrodinger equation which is simpler than the other one you saw above in that the partial derivative, or sorry, uh, what used to be partial derivative is now ordinary derivative. So this is now ordinary differential equation of second order. And for some of those, we can actually solve them quite rigorously, although we almost never will. <laughs> so, um, but you will see some examples of this application, application of this equation this week uh, with the particle in a box, uh, the simplest possible scenario where we can apply this. And uh, yeah, and the next section is the simplest possible application of the Schrodinger equation, uh, quantum particle in a box. And there are certain features of it that makes it as uh, simple as possible. 
And one of them is that it's an infinite square well. Uh, this infinite part is important because it allows us to write the wave function, resulting wave function in a much simpler way than it would be otherwise. So, so um, in your lecture, in the lecture, you will see this cover scenario covered uh, twice. Uh, first, um, kind of at the beginning of the set of lectures with uh, everything you learned from uh, last week and kind of starting from that, how far can we get? And after we introduce the Schrodinger equation, how does the Schrodinger, the solution to Schrodinger equation matches with the solutions you, you have seen before? So, so you will see that. And uh, this particle in a box, it's the simplest possible scenario. And so the first time I taught this class, I used to also do a finite square, square well where the potential doesn't go quite all the way to infinity, but goes to some value and then flattens out. Um, and the first semester I covered it, I realized, oh, this is difficult and takes a lot of time. <laughs> we'll see if we, ha we have time to cover that. Definitely not today, but maybe sometime next week or the week after. Um, if we don't, then there are other situations that we can work out that you see in the chapter. But I just want you to mention that finite square well, uh, it's one of the things you can actually cover in a simulation. The simulations give you a much easier way to approach it. Um, that's not quite as difficult as if you're doing it by hand. But um, but I want you to point out now that this quantum particle in a box being a simple case relies on your potential function going to infinity at these regions, regions outside of the box. If they don't, then this is um, even the finite square well is quite difficult to question actually. Um, so yeah, so, and this is where they are applying the normalization condition and all that stuff, a boundary condition. <laughs> um, so all this is covered in the lecture and also please do take a file, read it through the textbook again, see if this uh, makes sense. And you know, this result that you will see derived, it's, you can actually connect this to something you have seen last week because you can rewrite this energy as a kinetic energy, momentum squared over uh, 2m. So here's 2m and this uh, n squared, the pi squared, the h bar squared over l squared. Turns out that's the allowed values of momentum that's uh, consistent with the de Broglie relationship and the standing waves that would fit within the box. So this is a result that we could have gotten last week without all the machinery of a Schrodinger equation. Um, yeah, and this is the whole solution with, uh, this is the normalized wave function. And one place where this is quite useful is when you are trying to calculate the expectation value, which you will see next week, not this week. Um, and yeah, so these are illustrations of the solutions. Um, so yeah, that's a particle in the box. That's the simplest possible case. And it's the only case where we will actually explicitly solve uh, for the wave function in the Schrodinger equation or more likely in my case, uh, pretend to solve by guessing a convenient solution, plugging it in, checking that it oh, satisfies the Schrodinger equation and then matching the boundary condition. Um, the as I say in the lecture, one of the dirty secret about solving differential equations in a physics class is very seldom we actually solve the differential equations. You know, in math 3F, the differential equations class, you actually do quite you so you do solve quite a number of differential equations. I think even up to second order or even higher order. You do that in the math class. It takes a lot of time. Uh, in a physics class. Um, if we can somehow guess the correct answer, that's good enough for us, as long as we can double check, verify that the, the guessed answer is correct. So that's uh, what we'll do in section 7.4. And for the rest of the uh, setups, we won't even do that. For example, quantum harmonic oscillator. It is an important situation because so many of um, scenarios can be so many of the physically realistic setup can be approximated as a harmonic oscillator. So it's something worth spending a lot of time on and, um, and you do in upper digital quantum mechanics. And we will spend time looking at the allowed energy levels 
and the wave function solutions. And uh, we won't do any work of, um, we will maybe do some work of verifying that these are indeed the allowed energy values, but um, these solutions, um, we won't even pretend to do the work of finding these solutions because it takes quite a bit of advanced math. This is like two, three weeks of operative jump quantum mechanics. Uh, for the lowest energy levels, I might have you do kind of, okay, this is the solution. Can you check that this satisfies Schrodinger equation? Uh, it's, I think, reasonable to do for these lower energy levels. But once this gets to higher energy level, then even just taking the derivatives, you know, double derivative in space and all that gets to be actually a lot of work. So um, you will see us handle some of this using uh, computer algebra system and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it, um, so most of the things you will have to know this is, section are results. Uh, most particularly the allowed energy levels and to the extent that you have to know wave function, the solutions, it'll kind of be given to you. Uh, you don't have to memorize them. I mean, you know, not that any, yeah, so, um, so, um, but uh, so, so even something like a harmonic oscillator, which is very common, useful, and you would think is not that hard. It's hard enough that we can't quite do it um, from scratch in this lower division class. We will just cite the results that someone else derived without justification and with limited verification in cases when they are easy to verify. Um, and the final section covered in the textbook, and this we will actually spend a fair amount of time on, uh, is the um, dealing with us what's called a step potential in um, in well step potential. You could almost look at this as a one half of a finite square well because you know you have one half of the square well and the other half it's just flat <laughs> you couldn't look at it that way and uh, that does make the algebra simpler and uh, so this is something that I've covered every semester I've taught this class and we will actually a lot of time almost uh, half of the time we spend the next week will be um, about this um, uh, about quantum mechanical waves incident on a, a step potential barrier and how uh, that barrier uh, affects the, the particle. And one of the interesting phenomenon that happens is what's called quantum tunneling. You need uh, a barrier that's both limited in height and width. And when you have an incident particle that's of energy, that's not quite up to the energy of the barrier. So classically, you would expect the particle to be all reflected quantum mechanically some are reflected, but there is a non-zero transmission possibility. So we'll spend quite a bit of time next week going through all the algebraic details of this. This is actually quite doable because the calculus portion of it is easy. We just to guess a complex wave, <laughs> a wave solution, and, and they tend to just happen to work out. And in the region where it's the other way, the, this. Uh, exponential solution turns out to be a real exponential and but it's all doable and really the remaining work is the algebraic work of uh, matching the boundary conditions it still involves you know lots of constants so it still involves a fairly large system of equations and takes a lot of time but but it's doable so uh, so we'll spend time uh, analyzing something like this next week so but yeah it's kind of uh, system of equations like this that you derive from the Schrodinger equation and then work through. So, so yeah, and, that, and, yeah, and driving this formula is also something that should take quite a bit of time if you're driving it from scratch. So, so yeah, um, I think that's uh, probably, uh, Enough. I don't know if we covered this in lecture. Uh, let me see. You could, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't really. These are nice examples to read about it, but you won't see any homework questions on either radioactivity K or the, what is it, field emission <laughs> um, as an example of that. These are, um, 
I mean, they, they are meaningful, useful. And one example that Diana mentioning here is um, something called the Evanescent Wave. That's uh, also, uh, you can get a, a practical setup of quantum tunneling using Evanescent Wave, which is a setup using total internal reflection. So all these are, you know, it's, it's not something that's uh, highly abstract and um, way beyond. It, it's not any of that. It's uh, quite accessible, something that you can easily do in uh, even in lower division lab. Um, yeah, anyways, but uh, a lot of these examples we won't quite cover. Um, uh, all these three examples, uh, quantum dot. And <laughs> so read about it in the textbook. I hope it uh, gives you something to think about. But in terms of homework, you won't have to worry about this.